Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. We begin tonight with breaking news. After a years-long investigation into former President Donald Trump and the Trump Organization, the company and its CFO have officially been criminally charged. Alan Weisselberg appeared in a Manhattan courtroom today and pleaded not guilty to avoiding paying taxes on nearly $2 million in income. Weisselberg was released, but he had to surrender his passport after prosecutors said he was a flight risk. The Trump Organization also pleaded not guilty to what prosecutors say was a 15-year tax fraud scheme. But the company and Alan Weisselberg were hit with a 15-count indictment that includes multiple counts of falsifying business records, criminal tax fraud, and one count of grand larceny. So that's the Trump Organization and Alan Weisselberg both charged. One of the Trump Organization attorneys spoke about the indictment outside of the courthouse and called the charges politically driven. So uh, these charges are unprecedented. They are unique. I think in 244 years, we have not had a local prosecutor go after a former president of the United States um, or his employees or his company. And that is, a, uh, that is a significant line to cross. And quite frankly, not just as a lawyer, but as a citizen, uh, we're very concerned about that. I believe the political forces uh, driving today's events um, are just that. It's uh, political, politically driven, uh, notwithstanding uh, the statements by uh, my colleague uh, at the DA's office uh, in court today. So that's what we're hearing from the lawyers for the Trump Organization. But how political does this sound from the indictment itself? The indictment says from 2005 up to yesterday, the company and Weisselberg and other executives devised and operated a scheme to defraud federal, state, and city tax authorities. The purpose of the scheme was to compensate Weisselberg and other Trump Organization executives in a manner that was off the books. Prosecutors are alleging a 15-year tax scheme, and they are saying it wasn't just Alan Weisselberg. Trump lawyers can call this political all they want, but it sounds to me like this is where things start to get really real. And starting us off tonight, former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid and former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner, both are NBC News legal analysts, and I am so excited to have you here on this historic day, actually. And Barbara, I'm going to start with you. Just how serious are the crimes being alleged in this indictment? Can you get real prison time for the things that are alleged? Absolutely. And as you say, looking at the document itself, it's very hard to characterize this as politically motivated. And, you know, I, I'm sure that the Trump Organization's lawyers are counting on the fact that many people won't bother to read it. But if you look at it, it's 15 pages and it documents a 15-year scheme to evade the payment of taxes, concealing payments of, uh, in the form of benefits like cars and apartments and uh, private school tuition, bonuses, uh, home improvements. And by doing that, the Trump Organization was able to compensate its employees in a way that they didn't have to pay taxes on these things. And in addition, the Trump Organization was able to evade its own payroll taxes. And so the charge, the main charge in this case is grand larceny, because this is a form of stealing, stealing property that doesn't belong to the Trump Organization. It may sound more sophisticated and fancier than the way a lot of other people steal money, but at its core, that's what it is, stealing money that doesn't belong to them. Well, that's a, a great way to think about it, because a lot of times, Glenn, we look at white collar crimes and we, we think somehow uh, they're less serious than, than other types of crimes um, that involve theft, for example. Um, what does today's indictment mean for Donald Trump, his, organi his organization, his company, his business, the thing that he's most known for, uh, besides being president, is indicted? What does that mean for him? You know, it, it means a couple of things. First of all, it means that his organization for the last 16 years, because this crime was charged from 2005 right up until yesterday, the end date on the crimes in the indictment, June 30th, 2021, it was being run, at least on this financial front, as a corrupt organization. 
because the indictment lays out how there were two sets of books. That's almost cliche, right? In any mob movie, you have the right. purportedly official books, and then you have these uh, spreadsheets that were kind of off the record and under the table. And, you know, Barb said this was stealing, and that's exactly what it was. And look at some of the numbers. Over those 16 years, Weisselberg got this, you know, basically fraudulent compensation or compensation under fraudulent circumstances to the tune of $1.7 million. I'll tell you, to me, that's real money. And he basically stole yeah. $550,000 by not paying taxes in that amount that were due. He stole more than 100000 from the state of New York and a quarter of a million from the city of New York. And I love this piece because it tells us who some of the other people might be that are cooperating. The, the indictment sets out that Alan Weisselberg lied to his own tax preparer and claimed he wasn't a resident of the city of New York to avoid paying $250,000 in taxes. This was a 16-year scheme to defraud and at least on this financial piece, the Trump organization was being run in a corrupt manner. So I have a lot of questions about just how brazen uh, this conduct is and how they thought they would get away with this. I mean, like, I wish I could say I lived in New Jersey, even though I don't, um, and pay a different amount of taxes. But you get in trouble for that, I thought, Glenn. Um, and so... Speak to um, some of the other organization executives, because there were other executives that were referenced in this indictment um, that may have engaged in the same conduct, um, where uh, you describe them saying, oh, yeah, we, we um, uh, don't have, they tried to engage in tax schemes. I'm not even going to try to describe it, but putting that, in, putting that question to you, Glenn. So, yeah, the, the um, indictment details that Alan Weisselberg was also responsible for setting up some of this fraudulent compensation, not only for his own family members, Zerlina, to the tune of $360,000 in tuition that was paid for some Weisselberg family members. It doesn't say exactly who, but the indictment also said Weisselberg orchestrated this same fraudulent financial situation for two Trump employees. We don't know who they are. They're not named. But there is another indication. Um, I think it's on page 14 of the indictment where there is an unindicted co-conspirator number one. We don't know who that is. And I wouldn't want to mm -hmm. speculate about who it is. We do know the controller of the organization, Jeffrey McConney, went into the New York grand jury and testified, which means under the laws of New York, he has immunity. I do not want to suggest that he's the unindicted co-conspirator, but that's one of the other names of a top official that we have heard who has at least testified and provided evidence. This is also fascinating to me because it gives a little bit of a window, Barbara, into you know, what people are trying to get away with inside of some of these organizations. I mean, there's always been speculation about the Trump organization may, maybe not being on the up and up. There are a million anecdotes about uh, how they either lied to uh, contractors about how much they were going to pay them or not paying them at all. Obviously, we know the Trump University case. Uh, in terms of just the Trump organization as a whole, you know, what's next? for the organization and the criminal case that deals with the, the organizational piece of this, as opposed to the Trump, Donald Trump personal piece of this. Yes, I think you hit on one of the things, Erlina, about a case like this. I think one of the keys to be, being able to facilitate crimes like this is the fact that it's a small, privately held company. Uh, you know, when you have a large multinational corporation and you have shareholders and you're a publicly traded company, there are all kinds of regulations that you are subject to and all kinds of disclosures that you have to make. When you're privately held, you don't have to show other people the books. And I think that is the way that companies 
organizations like the Trump Organization are uh, able to uh, avoid detection for some of these kinds of crimes. But in terms of what comes next, uh, Letitia James, the Attorney General of New York, who is par a partner with Cy Vance, the Manhattan DA in this investigation, has said that the investigation is ongoing and is continuing. And we know some of the areas that they have been looking at because they've said so in public filings and in reporting are bank fraud and insurance fraud. And that's based on some statements that Michael Cohen has made. You know, he's, of course, President Trump's former lawyer who testified before Congress. And he talked about uh, how the Trump Organization would use this strategy of manipulating the value of assets, sometimes inflating the assets when they were seeking loans, and sometimes deflating the assets when the time came to uh, pay income tax on some of these things. Uh, we also know that there has been uh, allegations of others involved in the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. Michael Cohen went to prison for that. Donald Trump was named as uh, individual one for directing and coordinating that activity. And so all of those things come under the umbrella of the Trump organization. So I'm sure that Cy Vance and Letitia James and their uh, prosecutors will run down all of those leads to the end. And if there is evidence of a crime, then we will see those in subsequent indictments. Glenn, can that list of uh, things that the Trump Organization was engaged in can be used? Can that list be used to create evidence of a pattern that the Trump Organization, this is how they did business, um, and they did it in all these different ways? Does that help bolster a case against the organization or, say, Donald Trump uh, personally? Yeah, there is a very definitive pattern when you have 16 years of double books, right? The purportedly official books and then the offline books with all this fraudulent compensation to evade taxes. So there is already a pattern um, that I think we can see, you know, this financial fraud that was deeply entrenched in the Trump organization. But I think there's another clue that we have, and, and, and that's as follows. We just saw Cy Vance impanel a six-month special grand jury, and we are on the front end of that six months right now. If this was the only indictment that D.A. Vance intended to seek from the grand jury. He could have done it from the regular four-week New York grand juries that had been sitting, and yet he put a six-month or requested the court to put a six-month special grand jury in place. We're still on the front end, and we just got a consequential indictment. I think that's another clue that not only is the investigation ongoing, but we could very likely see additional superseding indictments. Well, we will have you both on speed dial <laughs> uh, as we go forward, because obviously uh, there will be more to discuss as this case continues. But today is a major day. The Trump Organization being indicted, it, that seems like a long way from season one of The Apprentice. Glenn Kirshner, thank you so much, as always, for taking the time out and for being with us. Barbara McQuaid, sit tight. We're going to be back with you to talk about Bill Cosme in just a few minutes. Joining me now is someone who won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on the Trump Organization and Donald Trump's business dealings. David Farenthold is a reporter for The Washington Post and MSNBC contributor. And I wanted to talk to you all day because when I when I saw the indictment, my first question was, what does this mean for his money? Like, what does this mean for his bank accounts, his company, his business dealings? He's the guy from The Apprentice. So from what you know about the culture inside the organization, how are they processing all of this? What's happening over there today? You know, it's a really small organization at the top. It's not, there's not that many people. And Alan Weisselberg is probably the most important. I think it, the last four years have shown you could take Donald Trump out of the Trump organization and it'll still run. I don't know if you took Alan Weisselberg out of the Trump organization, if it could continue on. He's the guy who understands where every dollar goes, who, how all the complexities, all the different the web of LLCs, how it all works together. So the fact that he's indicted, he's distracted, he may not be able to do his job as much, that's an impact on the Trump organization right off the bat. I, I think they're struggling to figure out, I mean, they have a lot of problems. They have lost a lot of customers because of their politics. They lost a lot of customers because of COVID. Now, as they try to rebuild after COVID, the, the company's under indictment. So it's not a death blow by any means, but it's a very serious problem at a time when they already have a lot of them. So in terms of Donald Trump's finances, I mean, you've been reporting on that 
uh, you're you're the the point person on that topic in the country. Does anything in the indictment surprise you from what you know based on your reporting? It did actually. This was a part of the Trump organization that it's really hard to see inside unless you have a subpoena or several subpoenas. And so what we saw here was that according to prosecutors, they were running two sets of books. It's sort of the most like classic fraud you could imagine that they had one set of books in which they counted these payments for Alan Weisselberg's car, apartment, you know, family members' tuition, where they counted those as compensation. And then they had another set of books they showed to the IRS where the compensation was absent. You know, if you're prosecutors and you run across that, but literally two sets of books, you have to be pretty happy because that's a, that's a fairly easy case to make. We didn't know that was going on. Uh, we didn't really even suspect it was going on. It's a part of the organization that I think only a few executives knew um, so, yeah, I was surprised by what we learned today. Hmm. That's so funny. I mean, yeah, Glenn, Glenn was talking about that in the, in the previous conversation. The two sets of books is straight out of a movie or even like The Wire. I mean, Stringer Bell said, do not take notes if you are involved in a criminal conspiracy. It's just like a pro tip, you know, pro tip. Don't don't write it down. Um, so let's pivot and talk about Donald Trump, the former president, personally. He says he's not worried about this investigation. He's he's just moving on with his life. But from what you've seen happen to his businesses as a result of the insurrection, um, and as you said, many people don't want to do business and the pandemic, should he be worried, big picture, in terms of how his business is going to handle the fallout from all of these things? I think he should be. I mean, honestly, I don't know the point of the Trump organization now. Donald Trump has clearly moved on to politics as the chief vocation of his life. The Trump organization is kind of a, a mishmash of, of it's, in, it's got a toe in a bunch of different industries. A lot of the industries it's in are hurting. Its properties are often in places where Trump supporters are not. If you remember that his hotels are aimed at like a urban, wealthy big city demographic, people that can spend $500 on a hotel room because they want the ultimate in luxury. That's the, a bad place to be trying to sell the Trump brand right now. So I, I think that there are, the company is struggling with a lot of problems, in part because it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I've wondered, if you're Trump and politics is your game now and your family's really transitioned into politics, why do you have this company, which is struggling in so many different places? So we don't know what's going to become of the Trump organization, but I think it's struggling with the sort of its logic to exist right now. So in that organization, we all know that the kids, the three adult children of Donald Trump, those they're a major part of uh, the Trump organization and the business. What happens to them? Do they have to liquidate assets or anything because of this investigation? Do you anticipate them being affected uh, by the fact that the Trump organization has been indicted and they are obviously a major part of that company? There's no major implication, direct implications because of the indictment. There's no, you know, they're not going to be put out of business or anything. Even if they're convicted, if the Trump organization is convicted of a crime, probably the consequence will just be some fines. Uh, that said, there's a lot of collateral damage that comes out of this. You know, there's reputational damage, but also maybe harder to find vendors, to get government contracts, to get to work with your lenders. Even liquor license can be, licenses can be affected if somebody on the license is convicted. So, it adds another an extra level of complexity. And I have to say, you talk about the Trump children, and there was a time in which they were all sort of equally involved. I don't see that now. Don Jr. is mainly involved in politics. Ivanka is mm -hmm. doing her own thing. It's mostly Eric Trump. Eric Trump is the one who's sort of managing all of this. Um, and I don't see an indication that he's legally caught up in this, that he's going to be indicted. At least they've given no sign of that so far. But now he has to run this company that's got all this dead weight on it. At the same time, and his father is sort of disengaged. His CFO has been indicted, and the company's been indicted. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a less than ideal situation. Last question, and talking about the present um, and future, Donald Trump is out on the campaign trail again. Um, he Yesterday he went to the border, and over the weekend he held a rally in Ohio. So he's back out there, to your point. He's pivoted to his new career, which is politics. Um, who's What's your insight into how that is being funded? I know he has a PAC, but... Do we have any insight into how he is fundraising and paying for all of this, considering the fact that he ran a company that had double books? Well, he has started a new pack, which has gotten a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars, and has relatively little overhead. I mean, I think it mostly sends out emails and pays a few staffers. 
We have not seen the books for its expenses. I think we might see them by the end of July. I'm curious about that because I want to know how much money Trump's PAC has spent at Trump's properties, you know, converting, which is something he did a lot as president, converting campaign contributions into private money for himself. So we're not, we don't know all about its finances, but Trump's political operation is very well funded. He's got a ton of money and he doesn't have much to spend it on. He just flies himself around the country occasionally and pays some staff. I'm, so I don't think that is a problem. That's why I think the Trump organization is a, pro, is, a, is a business with a lot of cash flow questions and not a great reason to exist going forward. So I've always wondered why they don't just pivot to politics where there's ample money and not that very many of these same problems. Well, we'll see how this all unfolds, and maybe they will pivot um, just to a political operation since clearly they, they are making the coins there. Um, well, using the coins for the campaign purposes, to be clear, to be specific about it. David Varenhold, thank you so much for being here this evening. First time on the show. It was so great to have you and help us understand uh, the implications of today's indictment. Please stay safe. Coming up, a day later... A lot of people are still trying to make sense of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision to let Bill Cosby walk free. Barbara McQuaid will be back to talk about how we got here. We'll be right back. If a man goes to jail and is accused of this crime and he's convicted and he goes to jail and then all of a sudden, mysteriously, miraculously, judges on the Supreme Court say, oh, well, that was a big mistake and forget about it. It's over. Let him go. Let him out. Well, I mean, what do we have? What, what's left? Where do we go? Catherine McKee accused Bill Cosby of raping her in a Detroit hotel room in the 1970s. She's one of more than 60 women who have leveled accusations against Bill Cosby, ranging from groping to sexual assault to rape. Cosby has denied all allegations of wrongdoing, and yesterday his 2018 conviction of aggravated indecent assault against Andrea Constant was overturned by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Cosby has previously said his contact with Constan was consensual, and now Cosby is a free man, and his accusers are left searching for answers. How did we get here, and why did this happen? And it's impossible to answer those questions without talking about Bruce Castor. Bruce Castor, this man right here, this is the guy he represented Donald Trump during his second impeachment trial. But before that, he was a district attorney in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, where Andrea Constan first accused Cosby of drugging and assaulting her in 2004. As former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid highlights in a new op-ed, Castor oversaw the case and decided against criminal charges because of insufficient, credible, and admissible evidence. Castor was essentially letting Cosby off the hook criminally so that he could be vulnerable to civil penalties. But that meant when prosecutors revived the case in 2015, they were still beholden to Castor's promise, making the conviction a violation of Cosby's due process. McQuaid concludes with this, quote, Enforcing the constitutional right to due process sometimes leads to awful results. But if the protection is to work for any of us, it must be enforced for all of us. And back with us is former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid. So, Barbara, to start, let's just make it clear make a clear line, like let's draw the picture for folks. 
how do we get from the agreement Bruce Castor made with Bill Cosby that was not written down to what happened yesterday where they overturned the conviction and let him out of prison? Well, first, Jolena, I agree with you that this is an awful result for all the survivors out there of sexual assault, not just those who've been sexually assaulted by Bill Cosby, but all the others out there. It's a, it's, it feels like a setback. Um, but I, I hope that people will see this for what it is, which is a procedural problem in this case, not a, a, a judge disbelieving what the witnesses had to say. And so to answer your question, in 2005, Bruce Castor, who was at the time the prosecutor, assessed that the case was not one that he could win. Now, he based it on some notions that I think have been debunked, like the fact that the victim delayed in reporting by a year, that she continued to associate with Bill Cosby, who was obviously a rich and powerful and famous person, and, and some of those other tropes that we have uh, since debunked, but made that decision that he didn't think he could prosecute the case. What he says now is that he issued a press release to say that he would not be prosecuting the case because he wanted to strip Bill Cosby of his Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination because he was concerned that Bill Cosby would assert his Fifth Amendment rights to block his own testimony in the civil case that was brought by the victim. And so he believed he was helping her by making this statement. Now, I think he overreached by going out of his lane. And what the court held uh, yesterday is that not only he, but even his successors at that prosecutor's office were bound by that promise because Bill Cosby acted in reliance on that promise and did testify at that deposition and did ultimately pay $3 million in, as a settlement for that case. Uh, it's unfair to what the, do what the court called a bait and switch to make a promise and then to withdraw that promise. And so the promise is enforceable and he cannot be charged criminally for that crime by that prosecutor's office. So all of that is absolutely understandable. And, and I agree with you, even though I, I have a personal stake in this, I'm a survivor, I'm very upset about this case personally. But I understand the law and I understand the Constitution. So everyone deserves the right, uh, the fifth, their Fifth Amendment protection. So I understand why the judges on the Supreme Court made this decision. However, the reason why we were reliant upon this one case in Pennsylvania is because there, there are statutes of limitations on sexual assault cases, depending upon which jurisdiction you're in. So in your view, is that one of the areas where we need policy and legal changes? Um, to this area of the law so that the 60 women that came forward, 60 plus women that came forward alleging uh, sexual assault against Bill Cosby can actually have a day in court. Because while Bill Cosby's due process rights are absolutely important to protect, they don't have any, any ability to, to come forward um, and, and get their day in court as well. I agree with you, Zerlina. I think this is a really important policy change, and I think it's one of those things that when you have more representation in legislatures of women, you might see these kinds of things becoming priorities. And um, having a longer statute of limitations, I think, is particularly important in the arena of sexual assault. Uh, and that's because it is a, a tendency of people to delay in reporting uh, because of the victim shaming that goes on, because of the intimidation that goes on by a assailants uh, because of the fact that sometimes powerful people, powerful men, uh, abuse their positions of authority to make it difficult for people to come forward. So we are seeing changes in the law mostly relating to uh, victims who are juveniles at the time that they are assaulted, giving them time to bring forward these kinds of claims, understanding that as children they're particularly vulnerable to these kinds of attacks and might be extremely reluctant to report. But I think anyone who is a victim of sexual assault should be afforded that same benefit of having time to report one of these sexual assaults. One of the things you also talk about in your op-ed is uh, due process mattering even for monstrous crimes. Um, but how do we sort of balance that, you know, the scale of justice is that um, the woman with, with the scales. Um, so how do we balance that priority with, you know, the idea that we don't want uh, so many of these women testifying in the trial because that would 
that would those bad acts being introduced will prejudice the jury against the defendant. I mean, that came up a lot in this case, in the first trial and in the second trial. How how can that is that a policy change? How do we get to a place where judges can say no, you know, 10 women over here with the same story is relevant and not necessarily uh, un unjustly pre prejudicial? The Supreme Court in this case never reached that question. They reached their decision on the basis of this promise and thought it was necessary to enforce it. And so that ended the matter. Um, but I was encouraged by the finding of the trial court in this case and even the intermediate appellate court that said it was proper to allow those other women to testify, even though they hadn't been charged. Uh, he hadn't been charged with sexual assaults of those particular women. The evidence was admissible not to show that he has a propensity to engage in this kind of crime, but to show that this was his M.O., that he would use some sort of drug mm -hmm. to incapacitate women and then engage in non-consensual sexual activities. And so because that was the M.O. that was used in this case, that evidence was relevant. That is a rule of evidence under uh, the, the rules of evidence, 404B, prior bad acts, that can be introduced for that limited purpose. And so it's a matter of discretion for judges. They have to balance those things, as you talked about, the scales of, judge, of, of justice. There is some prejudice that is caused by that, but is it substantially more prejudicial than it is probative? And in this case, the court found that that, that was not met, and so he did allow it to come in. And I think it was part of what helped this jury uh, find Bill Cosby guilty. Well, hopefully uh, in the future there will be policy changes based on this case um, and hopefully more women will be elected because that is such a critical point um, in just having policymakers who even have the presence of mind to think about a statute of limitations being an obstacle to getting justice in a sexual assault case. Uh, Barbara McQuaid, thank you so much for being here for both segments and for helping us on this very busy news night. Please stay safe. Coming up. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi taps rogue Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney to join the select committee on the January 6th insurrection. Will she face consequences from GOP leaders? Plus, did the Supreme Court just kill the Voting Rights Act? We'll talk about today's monumental ruling when we come back. from the civil rights movement are iconic. Whether it be the Freedom Fighters in 1961 or the March on Washington and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in 1963 or the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965, all the blood, sweat, and tears shed by those brave men and women were leading to something. That something was the Voting Rights Act. It was signed into law a few months later in 1965, and it was a monumental piece of legislation for civil rights in America. But over the years, the Supreme Court, they have weakened the Voting Rights Act. And today, the high court, they struck basically a full body blow. The 6-3 decision in Bronovich v. the DNC is a major hit 
to what remains of the Voting Rights Act. The case was about two controversial voting laws in Arizona, which criminalize what's known as ballot harvesting, and the other throws out ballots cast in the wrong precinct. Those were being challenged on claims that they would disproportionately impact minority voters, but the court's conservative majority didn't see it that way. Mark Joseph Stern didn't mince words with his take on the ruling today. Just read the headline of his article for Slate. The Supreme Court just mangled the Voting Rights Act beyond recognition. He writes, in theory, the VRA still stands. In reality, it has been flattened into meaningless symbolism just when black and brown Americans need it the most. Well, when you put it like that, it sounds really, really bad. And joining me now to discuss today's ruling is the author of that article, Mark Joseph Stern. He's a staff writer for Slate. So, Mark, explain exactly what this ruling today means. Is the VRA dead? Pretty much in practice, uh, if not altogether uh, deceased, it is certainly flatlining. Um, so let's back up here and remember that in 2013, in Shelby County v. Holder, the Supreme Court struck down the most important part of the Voting Rights Act, which required states with a racist history uh, to submit voting restrictions for approval to the Justice Department before they took effect. Uh, so that part of the law has been gone since 2013. All that remains is a part called Section 2, which contains this really important provision that we call the results test. And it basically says that if there is a voting restriction that has the result of disproportionately burdening racial minorities' ability to vote, then it's illegal and federal courts have to block it. And Zerlina, that is so important because think about it. Legislators do not go onto the floor of the state house and say, we hate black people and we're passing this bill because we don't want them to vote, right? Legislators don't admit racist intent. It's almost impossible to prove. And what the results test did was allow courts to strike down voting restrictions, even if they weren't proved to have racist intent because they had this disproportionate impact on racial minorities' access to the ballot. I mean, there, is, there are a lot of books about this already out there, but like people need to read more about how laws can be written to look completely benign, but the impact of them means that black people are discriminated against, and that's sort of what we do here in America. We write the law and we say, it's colorblind, and then only black people are hurt by it, and we're like, oh, we didn't realize. Um, what's the rationale behind the majority opinion? What, what was the reasoning outlined in the ruling? Yeah, so uh, the Supreme Court took a look at these two Arizona laws you mentioned and said, actually, these survive the results test. So according to the Supreme Court, these two laws do not have the result uh, of disproportionately burdening racial minorities. Uh, but if you look at the evidence, that is just objectively not true. OK, we have oodles of evidence that shows that both of these laws made it much harder for Hispanic people and Native people in in Arizona to cast a ballot. So how does the Supreme Court get around that? Well, Justice Sam Alito, in his majority opinion, says there are still other ways that these folks can vote. Uh, you know, it might have a, a bit of an outsized impact on racial minorities, but they can still access the ballot. They might just have to work harder. Sure, they'll be inconvenienced, but that doesn't matter. As long as they still have what he calls equal opportunity, then even if a law has a disproportionate burden on minorities. Uh, it's not unlawful under the results test, and it passes with flying colors under the Voting Rights Act. That feels so odd in terms of a, just a line of reasoning by the Supreme Court, considering other cases and even other areas of the law. It should matter that it makes a, a right that everyone should have. It matters, according to other cases, that it's harder to access that right. Or at least that's yeah. what I thought. Was it? Am I wrong about that? No, okay. you're absolutely so right. This is very I, I odd think... uh, in terms of Justice Alito's. The best part of Justice Elena Kagan's dissent, which I encourage everyone to read, uh, is when she describes mm -hmm. Justice Alito's majority opinion as a law-free zone. And I think she's exactly right, because his reasoning is not 
the reasoning that we use in any other context when we're talking about housing, for instance, or employment discrimination, and we're looking for disparate impact on minorities, we don't say, oh, well, sure, this black person was denied a house because the landlord was racist, but he could just go down the street and buy another house or rent another house. So it doesn't matter. We don't use this reasoning in other contexts. This is something that is totally divorced from the text of the law that Justice Alito made up out of whole cloth because I think he and the other conservatives are extremely hostile to the Voting Rights Act and want to shrink it down uh, to something small enough that you could drown in a bathtub. This is so that I mean, when you when you lay it out like that in terms of just how odd the reasoning is, I mean, it's like saying that black children have uh, segregation is fine because black children can go to the school. Um, they have access to the school like what it, it, I'm going to move on. You mentioned Kagan's dissenting opinion, which I loved as well. Um, last question, last minute. Um, in terms of you know her the, the idea that the Voting Rights Act is essentially the heart and soul of this democracy. So where do we go now? Because it feels to me like there's an attack on voting rights on the state level. The VRA has just gone down. S1 and S4 are on the table, but what happens to them even if they are passed? So certainly I think Congress should press forward with the voting rights bills that it's considering, but I think that it should also be considering court reform in tandem, either limiting the Supreme Court's ability to review the constitutionality of the laws that it's about to pass or hopefully passes, uh, or of course, adding seats to the Supreme Court. I mean, if that sounds radical, it can't be any more radical than six conservative justices rewriting the law that Congress passed by over overwhelming majorities to rip the hearts out of America's multiracial democracy. I really think the Democrats need to get smart about this and think about the fact that this court might not uphold any voting rights bills they try to pass, and they need to do a preemptive strike if they want this stuff to pass muster in court. Mm. That is such a good point. Mark Joseph Stern, we'll have you back because as this conversation continues and as Democrats fight to pass laws in the Congress, we need to understand that the 6-3 conservative majority will will strike down the laws that you pass. Like, that's how this will work. And so play chess. Play chess, everyone. Mark, thank you so much. Today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi introduced members of the select committee she has set up to investigate the January 6th insurrection. And the next step for us has always been to spot, seek and to find the truth. We want to do so in the most patriotic and nonpartisan way so the American people have confidence in the results. Pelosi called the committee the next step because the first step was to try to set up an independent bipartisan commission. You remember that. But the Senate Republicans, they blocked it. Pelosi named eight committee members. They're all Democrats. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, I'm being told one is a Republican. You see her there on the bottom left of your screen. That is Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Cheney said she was, quote, honored to serve, but because what happened on the 6th must never, ever happen again. But House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy didn't seem too thrilled that Pelosi picked one of his Republican members. Well, I was shocked that she would accept something from Speaker Pelosi. It would seem to me, as since I didn't hear from her, maybe she's closer to her than us. I don't know. You heard him. McCarthy was just shocked, shocked, he said, about Cheney's appointment to the select committee. I'm like, you took her off all of her, you took her out of leadership. What are you talking about? McCarthy can pick five members of his own for the, of his own party for the committee in consultation with Nancy Pelosi. The question is, will he do that? He seems determined to dismiss the committee as just, you know, politics. And he never engages in any of that. But let's look at the facts. There are still a lot of questions we need to answer about what happened on January 6th, including what led to the attack, What was Donald Trump's role in the attack? Was there inside coordination at the Capitol? And this committee is the one that gives us a a chance, just a chance, to get the answers to some of these questions. And joining us now is former Maryland Congresswoman and MSNBC political analyst Donna Edwards. 
Congresswoman McCarthy reportedly threatened Republican House members that they'll lose committee seats if they accept an invitation from the speaker for this select committee. What's going on here? I mean, it feels to me like he's he's acting like he's afraid of something. Do you have any idea what he might be afraid of? Well, I always thought that when Republicans in the House and the Senate really stopped, tried at least in the House and then in the Senate, stopped the bipartisan commission, the independent commission going forward, that it's because their party is afraid that not only are they going to find out the role that uh, the former president played in uh, the insurrection of January 6th, but they may find out that some of their members um, were engaged in that too, to some extent. And so I think that there's a lot of fear going on because why, after all, would uh, Leader McCarthy threaten his own members for merely participating in an analysis and evaluation uh, and understanding of what happened on January 6th? It is fear of what they might uncover and fear that they are going to uh, upset the former president and upset his base. And I think Liz Cheney is a patriot. I don't agree with most of her other politics, but on this, she is a patriot. She is saying, I have to take off my partisan hat and put on my patriot hat. And I think that the committee is going to be able to move forward whether or not McCarthy appoints members mm -hmm. uh, to this committee, even in consultation with uh, with Nancy Pelosi. And talk about playing chess. Nancy Pelosi played chess. I don't know what game these other folks are playing. Well, it's so funny to think about McCarthy from the beginning of this, because, you know, he was the guy on the phone with Donald Trump during the actual insurrection. And the day of the insurrection, the days immediately following the insurrection, he came out and he was like, this is bad. <laughs> this is because of Donald Trump. This should not happen again. And then he, he flipped the script after the meeting at Mar-a-Lago. Um, do you feel like they're going to ask him to come testify? Is that maybe what he's worried about? Well, they may. But remember that he made an entire speech on the floor of the House. That is going to be evidence for the record, I'm sure, whether or not he testifies. And it may be that there are other people around him. There are staff people. There are um, other members of Congress who might be called to testify to what they witnessed as well. Um, but, you know, whether or not there is testimony from Kevin McCarthy, it's really going to be important for this commission to really step back from the partisan politics, which I think this committee will do, given the makeup of the committee, and begin to examine the before, during, and after uh, to get these questions answered. What are some of the questions that you have about what happened before, during, and after the events of January 6th? It, it's such a, it's a day that I think we're, we're never, ever going to forget. I, I won't forget where I was standing when it all sort of started to unfold. Well, there's been some reporting that even before a handful of members of Congress were at least were talking with some of the uh, groups that were part of that Stop the Steal operation that then came to Washington and then came uh, to the Capitol. So I want to know uh, what that was about. I also want to know what the role of the president, the former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and their engagement on the day of and before. And I want to know uh, what happened with members of Congress who actually may have been giving tours uh, through the Capitol. Who were those tour groups and were they engaged in these activities? There are a lot of questions to answer, Zerlina. Absolutely. Uh, there are definitely questions that we still need to answer, and those are just a starting list, a starting point. So let's turn to voting rights. Do you think today's court ruling will finally move Senators Manchin and Cinema to see that they have a choice between either saving the filibuster or passing voting rights? And you know, in Cinema's case, I keep saying this, she needs to pass this bill. Otherwise, she's going to lose her election. Arizona went blue. Uh, and they passed this law as a result of that, in my opinion. <laughs> Well, and, and frankly, if you look at the, uh, the map, both for, both for 2022 and 2024, um, it really doesn't get better for, uh, for Democrats. And all of these laws being passed 
um, in, in, in states, the ones that are being proposed, um, really go at the heart of the Voting Rights Act. And so what the Supreme Court hasn't gutted, the states are eviscerating. And I think it's incumbent on all Democrats, um, even if they're operating in a purely partisan way, uh, to pass the Voting Rights and the John Lewis Voting Rights Enhance Advancement Act. Um, yeah, I, I just don't see how uh, Democrats can live with this idea that uh, the base of their party, black people, brown people, are going to be um, prevented from voting uh, because of what the Supreme Court has done and coupled that with what's gone on in the in these state legislatures. Democrats need to, um, you know, get a little wisdom on this or they're going to find themselves not wielding a gavel, but answering the call of the minority. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you wonder what they're thinking because, you know, it seems to me that it's actually something that they would do for their benefit. It's like, it's a very obvious choice. It's like, if you don't pass this, you're not gonna be able to win elections, which I thought is the whole thing. And Republicans, obviously, that's their priority as well. Former Representative Donna Edwards, thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. I hope you can come back very, very soon. Anytime you're available, let me know. We'd love to have you. Coming up, Britney's ongoing fight for freedom hits another major roadblock. Today, an L.A. judge decided to keep her restrictive conservatorship in place. What? We'll be right back. The Britney Spears conservatorship saga is continuing to unfold. The Los Angeles court overseeing her case denied a request first made in November to remove the pop star's father as the sole conservator of her estate. At the time, Spears' lawyer told the court she was afraid of him. Despite that, yesterday the court shot down her request, keeping him in control of her conservatorship. Back in November, the court did, however, agree to appoint wealth management firm Bessemer Trust as co-conservator of Spears' estate. The problem with that? The firm says it didn't know Britney wasn't a fan of the idea. So Bessemer Trust is now trying to withdraw from the agreement, citing Spears' public wishes to terminate the conservatorship. And it's important to note that the decision today does not consider Spears' bombshell 24-minute testimony to the court that we talked about last week, where she pleaded with the court to end her, quote, abusive conservatorship. In fact, the judge can't make any ruling based on that testimony because Spears has yet to file a petition to formally terminate her conservatorship, which I learned today in my reading of this is a very important piece of this. So joining me now to help us understand all of this, because it is a a, a case about one celebrity, but it also has so many other cultural implications. Legal analyst Lisa Green is here. So Lisa, explain this ruling today. It's very narrow, but explain what it means. Sure. You know, it, uh, as you pointed out, dates back to last year when there was a petition made to remove Jamie Spears, Britney's father, from control over her finances. Now, remember, there's two parts to this conservatorship. One has to do with money. And one has to do with Britney personally, although, of course, they're closely intertwined because lots of decisions about Britney have to do with money. Uh, Her lawyer asked the court to remove 
her father, Jamie, from co-managing the finances. And today the court ruled uh, that would not, or yesterday rather, that would not be the case. While the request was several months old, what's significant is that it was signed you know, this week after the extraordinary testimony we heard from Brittany herself last week. So one of the questions I have is, you know, I have a little bit of experience with conservatorships, just in, personally. Um, so I have a little bit of familiarity, but I don't understand why it's so hard for her to undo this. She's an, she's an able-bodied adult woman who is working and earning an income. Why is it so hard for her to get out of this conservatorship? Is there any policy reason for that whatsoever? You know, um, the policy issue about conservatorships is really significant, and I'm glad you brought it up because the amount of authority you lose, you lose agency, which is such a classic, important right, right? And you are unable to make significant and even insignificant decisions about yourself once you're placed under a conservatorship. But this is a highly unusual circumstance. And in fact, if you look at the judge's Mm -hmm. order, keeping Jamie Spears as part of the financial team, you see that she's checked boxes that say that Brittany is unable to really make decisions about her own finances. And Zerlina, we just don't know what we don't know. You know, the judge, I, I, have, I, right. I don't know this judge well, but she sounded sympathetic in the hearing last week. And yet she's making these decisions, presumably to protect Brittany. So we can only wonder notwithstanding everything we heard, that stunning testimony, what else is going on? in her life that renders her incapable and in the opinion of this one judge to, you know, balance a checkbook. It's so, so fascinating. Do you think that gender plays into this at all? I mean, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about because I just can't picture a male celebrity that got caught out by the paparazzi acting, uh, you know, apparently erratically, um, which male celebrities have been known to do. I can't imagine a young male celebrity having their mom put in charge of their bank account. Um, You know, I read somewhere some wag said that if, you know, Britney's behavior was the standard for conservatorships, half of Hollywood would be under a conservatorship. So it does seem to me her whole right. Her whole life has been led under this terrible double standard, the way she's been treated as against men in similar situations. But I have to say, you know, conservatorships are are not sort of a one and done thing. And and one of the things under California law is that uh, an investigator is supposed to go and check on the situation, report back to the court once a year. Certainly it is conceivable that there's just, you know, nonstop corruption, but it's also conceivable that we only have half the story or maybe not even half as the, you know, because Brittany and the conservator, the temporary conservator over Brittany's person are now squabbling themselves about who's responsible for the situation, whether either of them has ever listened to Brittany or treated her well. It's really a mess. Yeah, and it, it, it's so frustrating to, to see her, you know, struggle to articulate, not struggle, but, but you know, articulate all of the things that she's been going through over the years and and still not being able to get her agency back. And, you know, I know folks watching, they're like, how do you go from Trump indictment to Britney Spears? But let me tell you, this this has some very in- interesting gender themes and gender implications. And it's so I was so grateful to Lisa Green for taking the time to be here tonight and helping us talk through this latest Britney Spears news. That does it for me tonight. It was a big news day. We made it. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. The Many Hassan Show is coming up next.
Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Tonight, after weeks of breathless speculation, at last the Trump world move we've been waiting to see. That's right, today Donald Trump's allies launched the former president's new social media platform, Getter, as in Getter Done or Getter a Non-Disclosure Agreement. According to Politico, it has very few downloads so far and initial trending topics on the app included the hashtags Trump, Virus Origin, NRA and Unrestricted Bioweapon. I'm only kidding. That's not the big Trump news today. The criminal indictment of the Trump organization is, which centers around a man named Alan Weisselberg. He started out as an accountant for Donald Trump's father, Fred, in 1973. Soon afterwards, he started working on side projects for Donald Trump as he established his own real estate presence. By the late 80s, he was controller of the Trump organization, eventually working his way up over the decades to chief financial officer, CFO. In 2000, he was also named vice president of Trump's New Jersey casino company. Weisselberg even helped with Trump's personal tax returns and personal expenses. Ivanka Trump once described him an integral part in the Trump organization's growth and continued financial success. As a trusted member of the company, Weisselberg was even featured in a 2004 episode of The Apprentice where the Donald sung his praises. Replacing George this week is my chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg. And you think George is tough? Wait till you see Alan. Alan? I thought that Andy losing his lines of communication was a very serious matter. If this was a military maneuver and he lost his line of communication, he could lose an entire battalion. In January 2017, when Donald Trump became president, he entrusted Weisselberg to run the company along with sons Eric and Don Jr. Today, that decades-long fealty to Trump and the Trump organization was put to the test because today, Weisselberg surrendered himself to the authorities at 6.17 a.m. after the Manhattan District Attorney filed tax-related charges against him, including second-degree grand larceny. The charges stem from an alleged 15-year scheme by the Trump Organization to pay Weisselberg and possibly others with lavish benefits rather than a salary to keep it off the books. In other words, tax-free. Weisselberg was arraigned this afternoon where he pleaded not guilty. He was released after the hearing. The Trump Organization blasted the charges against Weisselberg, saying he's being used by the Manhattan District Attorney as a pawn in a scorched earth attempt to harm the former president. This is not justice, this is politics. Hey, at least someone in the Trump orbit is admitting he is, in fact, the former president. But back to the story. The Trump organization itself was also charged and also pleaded not guilty. Surprise. Documents unsealed after the arraignment say that since 2005, Weisselberg and others received substantial portions of their income through indirect or disguised means intended to allow certain employees to substantially understate their compensation from the Trump organization so that they could and did pay federal, state and local taxes in amounts that were significantly less than the amounts that should have been paid. The indictment says Weisselberg was one of the largest individual beneficiaries, concealing approximately $1.6 million in compensation from tax authorities, allowing him to evade more than $900,000 in tax over the duration of the scheme. Prosecutors also say that Weisselberg himself directed the company to delete records implicating him. A lawyer for, Trump, a lawyer for the Trump organization said the charges are unprecedented and suggested they're purely political. Certainly... Uh, given the given the nature and the unprecedented nature of these charges, that certainly um, that's the reason they were brought. Okay, if the name of the company was something else, I don't think these charges would have been brought. In fact, uh, I am fairly certain they would not have been brought if the name was a different name. To be fair. This is unprecedented. There were 44 presidents before Trump and none of them have ever had their businesses criminally indicted just months after leaving office. Congrats, Mr. Trump, another first for you. But Trump himself is not charged in this alleged scheme. Let's be clear about that. He did issue a brief statement after the arraignment and it's exactly what you'd expect. Quote, the political witch hunt by the radical left Democrats with New York now taking over the assignment continues. It is dividing our country like never before. Trump, always so concerned about division. Now, let's also remember that one reason why we even have charges to begin with is because District Attorney Cy Vance fought for access to Trump's financial records, taking that fight to the Supreme Court twice. 
and winning twice. Still, Vance has been criticised in the past for not going after powerful defendants. For example, dragging his feet in charging Harvey Weinstein and declining to charge Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump Jr. for alleged real estate fraud. Vance leaves office at the end of the year as he's not seeking re-election. So if, are, if after all this is over, if there are no charges, no consequences for the person in charge of the namesake Trump organization, what will that say about Vance's legacy? What will that say about accountability in this country? We've got a great group of people to help break this big story down for us tonight. Former U.S. Attorney and Judge Carol Lamb, former Trump Organization Executive Barbara Rez. She's also the author of Tower of Lies about her time in the Trump Organization and former Brooklyn prosecutor Charles Coleman. Thank you all for being with me tonight. Uh, Charles, let me start with you. The indictment says the Trump Organization paid for things like Weisselberg's rent, family members' private school tuition, personal car expenses, and much more, all of which went unreported or underreported at his direction. How serious are these charges, not just for Weisselberg, but for the Trump Organization, and maybe down the line for Donald Trump himself? Well, I think that to take your questions in reverse, Donald Trump has put a spare amount of distance between himself and some of the direct actions. And I think that's at the heart of what prosecutors are trying to get Weisselberg to ultimately help them out on in terms of potentially getting him to flip and give them information about. And that is to draw the connection between Donald Trump directly and some of these actions, because that, that connection right now does not exist. With regard to the severity of what has been pled in the indictment, I think that these are relatively severe uh, offenses, but I would not ultimately expect, even if they were convicted, that there's going to be jail time associated with them. I do think that viewers have to understand that it is notable that the IRS has not yet filed a case, and this is something that is tax related. That is very telling. It, it says to me, as a former prosecutor, that ultimately this is not a case that is going to blow the lid off of you know, uh, criminal charges as it relates to Donald Trump or even Mr. Weisselberg in, his, in, the, in this yeah. case. So I won't say that they're not serious, but they, but they you know, do matter to some extent. So, Carol, you're also a former prosecutor. Let me ask you this follow-up question, given what Charles just said. The prosecutor, the prosecutor in this case, said in court today, referring to Trump, quote, the former CEO signed himself many of the illegal compensation checks. The indictment alleges that Trump signed the personal checks that paid for Weisselberg's grandkids' tuition between 2012 and 2017. So why isn't Trump himself in court today pleading to any charges? All right, well, when you have a, a tax case, um, they can be very complicated cases and there can be a lot of defenses that are brought up. So for example, uh, one of the concerns might be that Trump might say, "Well, sure, I signed the tech, the I signed the checks, but I didn't know how, how the uh, how that money was being accounted for, and I certainly didn't know how Alan Weisselberg okay. was uh, treating those on the, um, you know, treating those in his personal tax return." So there is a built-in defense that they would need more evidence to prove. Yeah, that's a fair point. And of course, it's not like Donald Trump is known forever just admitting or acknowledging or taking responsibility for things. Uh, Barbara, you worked alongside Donald Trump for nearly two decades, but before the start of this alleged scheme. You know Alan Weisselberg. What was your reaction to these charges against him? Do you think Weisselberg is more or less likely to cooperate now he's been charged because he wasn't cooperating before? Well, I, you know, we really don't know the extent of which he is cooperating or not cooperating. Um, the prosecutors involved here are very, very smart people, and they're not they're not doing this for a legacy of getting Alan Weisberg for for uh, uh, special employee uh, uh, expenses uh, covered. Um, I, I think that Weisberg uh, probably is uh, terribly frightened right now. He doesn't know what happened to him. And uh, I think that he, that there is a potential that he will cooperate. I think it's a good potential, to be honest with you. They're talking about five to 15 years. Uh, you know, Alan is not a young man. That, that's a good chunk of his, the life he has left. He's not gonna give that up. I, I, I don't think that, uh, I, don't, I think he will cooperate. I, I'm inclined to think that he will. Interesting. Um, Charles, let me come back to you. you. Given what you said earlier 
I want to uh, read to you a quote from Daniel Goldman, who served as a majority counsel for the House Democrats in the first Trump in impeachment trial. And he tweeted this today, uh, quote, if Alan Weisselberg does not cooperate with the Manhattan DA's office, and all indications are that he has not and will not, that office will not be able to criminally charge Donald Trump for any of the conduct under investigation. As I say, it sounds like you agree with that. Let me know if you do. But also, others are saying, people like Michael Cohen, Trump's former personal attorney, saying, no, that's not true. Others are pointing to the New York AG's office saying, this is just the beginning. Well, I do agree with that assessment that the Congress made in his tweet. But what I will say is that Michael Cohen did provide some insight that I think would be helpful for Mr. to Mr. Weisselberg in as much as what we have seen in the course of Donald Trump's career is that he has no problem throwing his associates under the bus for the promises of exoneration or some sort of relief later on. He did that when he was president with Roger Stone. He did it when he was president with Michael Flynn. He's no longer the president now. So I don't know how much he has that will be of interest to Weisselberg in a way that will ensure that he does not cooperate with prosecutors. As the previous uh, speaker said, he's not a young man. And so this really may become a CYA situation for Weisselberg where he figures it's best to cut my losses before I get thrown under the bus the same way that it was done to Michael Cohen and end up facing a significant jail sentence. Carol, typically we don't see charges against an organization until the end of an investigation. Do you expect any other charges coming out of this investigation for the Trump organization in particular? I mean, it's also hard to believe that Donald Trump himself, you know, you mentioned earlier, his, de his defense could be, I had no clue, but should prosecutors just, you know, preemptively accept that that's going to be his defense and leave him alone? Or can they actually dig into what Trump knew? Oh, I don't think for I don't think for a moment that the prosecutors are giving up. Look, the, what I think has happened here is that they have been investigating, you know, in, in good faith. But remember, they only got those documents out of um, out of Trump's uh, accountants four months ago after going to the Supreme Court and battling it out. So they have not had a huge amount of time to put the whole case together. And remember, in white collar cases, frankly, in all criminal cases, you have to not just prove your case, you have to disprove all possible defenses. So they've got to go through every scrap of paper, every piece of information they have, talk to all the witnesses and make sure that no one's gonna pop out with a surprise that's going to lead to a potential defense. So I think this was, this is a starting point for their, you know, for what may be a series of, of indictments. But, yeah, and you know, the problem is that they were going to lose, they, I think they were going to lose some of these counts under the statute of limitations. So, um, you know, they were faced with this decision. Do we uh, go ahead and bring the case that we're comfortable bringing now? Or do we lose some of the counts and wait for something potentially bigger? I think they did the right thing. They, they took the low hanging fruit that they had, they brought the case and they will use it, um, you know, they, they will proceed with this. And if Weisselberg decides to cooperate, they'll have that. If not, they'll continue with their documentary case and other witnesses, and they'll just see what develops. But, but I think it was the right thing to do to take the case that they had and bring it. You know, $1.7 million in unreported income is not an insignificant case. It's only insignificant when yeah. you, know, you compare it to what some of the hopes and expectations of certain people were. Carol, do you see any sign of the Trump tax returns that Cy Vance went to the Supreme Court to get in today's filings or today's indictment? Are we going to get anything more out of his tax returns? I don't think we saw anything with respect to his tax returns in the indictment today. It doesn't mean that they're not you know, looking at them and pursuing the, the other part of the case, which is yeah. uh, really probably the more interesting part for, to most people, which is did the Trump organization and perhaps Donald Trump himself intentionally you know, basically mis, you know, mislead or, or falsely state um, the values of properties. And, and remember, the yeah. reason this is such an interesting indictment is it goes on and on for pages and pages under the scheme to defraud and the, and the conspiracy count describing how this, how this corporation worked for 15, 20 years. And what yeah. you see is a company that, you know, baked into its DNA is a complete disregard for rules and regulations if it's going to get into the way I, I of more money coming to the executives. Uh, I can't understand why a company that's called the Trump Organization would have such a disregard for rules. I just can't understand why. Barbara, let me ask you this. Why do people in the Trump orbit stay so loyal to him for so long when he shows no loyalty to the people who work for him? He throws them under the bus, as Charles mentioned, Michael Cohen and many others. 
I know, and not only does he do that if, if, if the need be arise, but he treats them poorly, very poorly. I mean, you've heard uh, the, the people like Kelly talk about how he was never spoken to that way in his life when Trump called, called him out for the first time. He's not very nice to his people, but he has things that, there's something like a Svengali like about him. They, they, they sort of like fall in line and they, they drink the Kool-Aid. And he does give them things. He gives them money and he gives them chits like, you know, with Alan. And all of that's purpose is to engender their loyalty and their appreciation and their love, as Trump might well, call it. And some of them have really fallen. They're really fallen I've, for him. I mean, I have to say, and when these people then go down on his behalf and, you know, fall under their fall on swords for him, I mean, smallest violin in the world playing, to be honest. But Barbara Rez, Carol Lamb, Charles Coleman, appreciate all of your insights tonight. Thank you so much. Boy, if conservatives were annoyed Liz Cheney wouldn't stop talking about January 6th before, well, now she's one of Speaker Pelosi's handpicked members on the new task force to investigate the January 6th attack. There she is standing with seven Democrats chosen to impanel the select committee that Republicans tanked despite bipartisan support, which I was told is a virtue in Congress. Whatever happened to that? This came on the heels of reporting that minority leader and human weather vane Kevin McCarthy told freshman Republicans that if any of them accepted a spot on the committee from Pelosi, they'd better be ready to accept all their committee assignments from her. Zing! Now that's how you play hardball. I'm not making any threats about committee assignments, but as you know how Congress works. You get elected by your district, and you get your committees from your conference. Do you believe that effectively by Liz Cheney accepting a committee assignment on January 6th, that she's left the Republican conference? Well, I was shocked that she would accept something from Speaker Pelosi. It would seem to me, as since I didn't hear from her, maybe she's closer to her than us, I don't know. Ooh, another classic McCarthyism. Wait, I think that might be something else. Look, there's good reason for Kevin McCarthy to oppose this committee. I'm just guessing they might be interested in, say, his conversation with the president on January the 6th. Already Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler has put out two statements about it. How do I remember two? Because the second one was literally headlined, Herrera Butler again confirms conversation with McCarthy regarding January 6th US Capitol attack. According to her, the minority leader told her when he finally reached the president on January 6th and asked him to publicly and forcefully call off the riot, the president initially repeated the falsehood that it was Antifa that had breached the Capitol. McCarthy refuted that and told the president that these were Trump supporters. That's when, according to McCarthy, the president said, well, Kevin, I guess these people are more upset about the election than you are. I guess so. But the thing that really gets me is that Kevin McCarthy would not strip Marjorie Taylor Greene of her committee assignments in spite of all her anti-Semitic, Islamophobic and other outrageous remarks. He wouldn't strip Andrew Clyde of his assignments or even chastise him for calling the rioters tourists. And he wouldn't strip Paul Gosar of his assignments for attending events with white nationalists while missing votes. So maybe that explains why this latest ultimatum isn't being taken seriously by some of his own colleagues. When Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger was asked what he thought about McCarthy's threat, he eloquently told reporters, who gives a bleep? Well, sadly, apart from Cheney and Kinzinger and a couple of others, the rest of their caucus do give a bleep. They're all running scared. Still ahead. I know I keep saying we need to get rid of the filibuster, but maybe, just maybe, one of these nights, Senator Kirsten Cinema will listen to me. Or even, she might listen to the Kirsten Cinema of old, who also used to question the need for 60 votes in the Senate. I think as the president so eloquently said on Wednesday, there's none of this pressure, this false pressure to get to 60. So what that means is that um, the Democrats um, can stop um, kowtowing to Joe Lieberman and instead seek other avenues to move forward with health reform. And so it's likely that the Senate will move forward with a process called reconciliation, which takes only 51 votes. <sighs> Why can't we have that kissed in cinema? Why not that one? Tonight, though, another major blow to voting rights, this time handed down by the Supreme Court of the United States. That's ahead in 60 seconds. Do not go away.
Earlier this month, there was a media buzz when Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett joined five other justices in rejecting a Republican challenge to Obamacare. It came on the heels of several other rulings in which Kavanaugh and Chief Justice John Roberts surprised observers by siding with the court's liberal justices. Perhaps, some thought, this court would not be as right-wing as we all thought. Not quite. Because when it comes to the biggest issue of all, preserving our democracy, our voting rights, the six conservative, justice, six conservative justices always fall into line. Exhibit A is today's Supreme Court ruling, a monumental defeat for democracy. By a partisan, yes, six to three vote, the highest court in the land today upheld two restrictive voting measures used by Arizona in the last election. One requires election supervisors to literally throw out votes that were cast at the wrong precinct. Another makes it illegal for someone to turn in another voter's early ballot at a polling place. The stated rationale for the two restrictions was the danger of voter fraud. But when lawmakers gathered to draft the ballot harvesting law, as it's known, in 2016, they couldn't find any evidence of voter fraud. Even the state's elections director, a Republican, could point to no specific instances where someone tossed away someone else's early ballot, something that was already a crime. GOP lawmakers pressed on anyway back in 2016. One even argued that perception, not reality, was the important thing. Quote, what is indisputable is that many people believe it's happening. You can't really argue with that. And I think that matters. Of course, the fraud didn't happen, but something interesting did happen. Both the Arizona restrictions, both of them, did impact minorities disproportionately. Surprise! Last year, a federal appeals court struck down the laws after finding that twice as many black, Latino and Native American voters cast their ballots in the wrong precinct when compared with white voters. That was a violation of Section 2 of the landmark 1965 Voting Rights Act. The panel ruled, but the Supreme Court's conservative wing, its conservative majority, reversed that decision today. In an opinion written by Samuel Alito, six justices said, it's totally fine to regulate fraud that doesn't exist. Quote, election fraud has had serious consequences in other states. The Arizona legislature was not obligated to wait for something similar to happen closer to home. As for the discriminatory effects of the laws, the majority did find ample evidence that Arizona Republicans wanted to make it harder for Democrats to vote, but it added, quote, partisan motives are not the same as racial motives. Hey, that's all right then. In a 41-page dissenting opinion, Justice Eleanor Kagan blasted the court's conservatives for further eroding the Voting Rights Act. Quote, I could say that this is not how the court is supposed to interpret and apply statutes, but that ordinary critique woefully undersells the problem. Oh, yes, it does. This ruling will make it harder to challenge the hundreds of proposed voting restrictions being pushed by Republicans across the country. And it came on the same day that Georgia's notorious new GOP voting law goes into effect. The same day that the Kansas League of Women Voters and other nonpartisan groups suspended their voter registration drives out of fear that they could be arrested under that state's new voting restrictions. Democrats have had little success blocking these laws at the state level. At the federal level, they have S1, the For the People Act, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, both of which would, would st strengthen federal oversight of elections and make new restrictions harder to pass. In fact, in a statement today, Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema, one of the two Senate Democrats who have refused to eliminate the Republican filibuster, said today's ruling will hurt Arizonans' ability to make their voices heard at the ballot box, adding that Congress should come together to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which I am proud to co-sponsor. What unmitigated chutzpah to be one of two Democrats standing in the way of progress and then bemoaning the lack of progress. But look, even if Democrats convince Cinema and fellow holdout Joe Manchin to end the filibuster, to move one of these bills, to get Joe Biden to sign it into law fast, it could just be gutted straight away by this partisan Supreme Court, packed as it is by Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. This court, which Neil Gorsuch joined after the outright theft of Merrick Garland's seat, it was supposed to be Garland's. This court, which Amy Coney Barrett joined last year, after 40 million Americans had already voted in the election, early voted in an election that her benefactor Donald Trump then lost. It increasingly feels as if the question, how do we save American democracy, depends on the answer to another question. How do we change, fix, rebalance this Supreme Court? Joining me now 
and Megan Hatcher Mays, Director of Democracy Policy for the progressive nonprofit Indivisible, and Brian Fallon, co founder and executive director of Demand Justice and former national press secretary to Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. Thank you both for joining me, both of you coming back on the show. It's just sad it's under these circumstances. A horrible decision today. Megan, let me start with you. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, lawmakers, almost all Republican lawmakers, have introduced nearly 400 new voting restrictions in 48 states this year. 22 of them have already become law. How much does today's court ruling narrow the grounds or get rid of the grounds for challenging any of those laws? Yeah, today's decision, I really can't overstate it. It was, was horrific. It was a, It's a very, very dark day for our democracy. What was left of the Voting Rights Act has now been significantly undermined. It has been gutted. The Supreme Court was not content to just gut sections four and five back in 2013. They decided to finish the job today and they significantly undermined section two, which was like one of the remaining enforcement mechanisms in the Voting Rights Act. That means that future challenges under section two will have to follow this new set of rules that Justice Alito just made up out of nowhere today. And it's going to be extremely hard for voters who have been targeted by these racist suppression laws to make their case in court as a result, as a direct result of today's decision. It's, it's very, very bad. Brian, there's that line the Washington Post uses, democracy dies in darkness. Actually, no, it dies in the plain sight of day in Samuel Alito verdicts, opinions. So my question to you is, where do you think the White House is in all of this, given the stakes are so high? Back in February, Joe Biden's DOJ wrote a letter to the Supreme Court that essentially said, sure, if you apply the Trump DOJ's interpretation of the Voting Rights Act, then these Arizona laws are fine, but the current DOJ, the new DOJ, disagrees <coughs> with that interpretation. We're not backing this case anymore. But that's all they really did. I mean, couldn't the DOJ, couldn't the White House have done more? Shouldn't they be doing more to push back? I think they should. And you saw the Biden White House react to the uh, ruling today by pointing to the need to pass these bills in Congress, like the John Lewis Act, like the For the People Act. And while they're right that those bills are necessary, they're not sufficient. Uh, because why, why, why are we needing to pass the John Lewis Act? It's because of a Supreme Court decision from 2013. We had a perfectly good law, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and it's because the conservatives on the Roberts Court are so hellbent on uniting behind voter suppression efforts that are springing up from the states and red states that we have to do this uh, Herculean task of trying to get cinema and mansion to get rid of the filibuster in order to pass a patchwork solution to solve the last bad Supreme Court ruling. It stands to reason that if we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, we'll be right back here in front of the same Supreme Court playing whack-a-mole, uh, trying to come up with a solution to another bad Supreme Court decision. As a matter of fact, in 2013, when John Roberts wrote the opinion that gutted Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, he specifically pointed to the continued, you know, the, the perseverance of Section 2. Uh, and said that, well, Section 2 still exists, so people can still challenge discriminatory laws based on Section 2. And now here we are eight years later, and now they've gone after Section 2. So they will not stop until they eradicate any voting protections that Congress may wish to pass. And that's why it's insufficient for the Biden White House to be pointing to the For the People Act. They also need to be getting behind Supreme Court reform, adding seats to the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, the Biden Commission, which is exploring this issue, which we just heard from yesterday, is for the most part twiddling its thumbs. We have a panel of academics Academics that are still largely clinging to the idea that the court is an apolitical institution and that ideas like adding seats would make it unduly political. And that view has just been belied yeah. by rulings like today's. Well said. Twiddling their thumbs as democracy burns. I want to come back to Supreme Court reform in a moment. But Megan, let me just ask you about this, this, this line that jumped out today. Because, you know, the court says it takes the specter of voter fraud very seriously. But they also seem to say that mm -hmm. racially, racial disparities in legal outcomes aren't a problem. At one point in the majority opinion, Alito writes that because, quote, minority and non-minority groups differ with respect to employment, wealth and education, even neutral regulations... There will even with neutral regulations, there will inevitably be some predictable disparities in rates of voting and non-compliance with voting rules. It seems as if this court is saying, well, you know, the outcome's not the issue. The issue is intent. And, you know, unless a sponsor of a law comes out and says, I'm doing this because I'm a racist, the court will never take racism seriously. 
Right. Actually, it's very interesting that that line was very interesting because it was like Alito got this close to almost understanding that systemic racism exists. But then he took a hard right away yes. from coming to that conclusion. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. That the idea now that under Section 2, based on these new rules that Justice Alito has written, and by the way, if Justice Alito wants to write legislation, I highly recommend he run for Congress. I would welcome his resignation from the Supreme Court. But that's what he did today. He rewrote this law because he felt like it. He has the power to do it. And he got five of his colleagues to go along with him. Yeah. But what he's done is basically said, he and he even acknowledged that these laws, there are disparities in how these laws affect different types of voters. But he just said, you know what, that's fine. That's actually fine because it's not that big of a deal. The, there's evidence in front of me that says there are disparities in how people are treated under these voting laws. But I'm throwing that out because there is this other thing that's bothering me. And it's Vote, the specter of voter fraud, which there is no evidence, not only no evidence in yeah. front of the Supreme Court, widespread or any other type of fraud, there's no evidence at all anywhere of widespread or any other type of voter fraud, but that bothered him more than actual evidence of black people, ind indigenous people, and people of color being denied the right to vote. It is really, really gross I to mean, see kind of the, the big lie make its way all the way up to the Supreme Court today. We've been saying on the show for a while in terms of the hysteria over critical race theory that why are Republicans obsessed with this stuff? It's not taught in elementary school, it's taught in law school. Apparently Sam Alito at law school didn't choose the critical race theory. As you mentioned, he came so close to understanding, but doesn't. <laughs> Brian, let's get back to the main issue before we run out of time. The main issue, Supreme Court reform, fixing the Supreme Court. I have to ask you, nothing personal, but you worked for Hillary Clinton. I think it's fair to describe Hillary Clinton, not a pejorative, as an establishment Democrat. Joe Biden is an establishment <laughs> Democrat. Why is it that establishment centrist Democrats do not get the need for urgent, radical reform, Supreme Court expansion, make D.C. a state, get rid of the filibuster? They want the ends, save democracy, but they won't will the means. Why, Brian? Why? Well, I think this is still a lot of people that are uh, hoping for the best and bought into the idea that John Roberts is an institutionalist. And um, I think two people, two groups of people were exposed by today's ruling. The first, you referred to it in the open. Uh, the first was uh, journalists who embarrassed themselves the last several weeks, creating this false narrative of a 3-3-3 court, uh, trying to suggest that based on rulings in, in, in niche cases like this Goldman Sachs class action case, that, oh, there's a moderate faction that's emerged yes. on the court, and Roberts and, and Kavanaugh and Barrett are not going to be as bad as liberals thought they were, and they didn't even wait till the end of the term, and these two big democracy-related cases today belied that whole narrative. The second grouping is a broader um, establishment view that exists among a lot of legal elites and a lot of establishment figures, many of them progressives. Um, a lot of them had a speaking role at yesterday's commission hearing. These are professors like Noah Feldman at Harvard. Uh, these are people like Stephen Breyer, who himself has suggested that he might not retire this year for, because he worries that retiring now yes. would make the court look political. Well, of course, it's already political. And so I just recommend to all your viewers, people should go back and read Nicholas Bowie's testimony. He's a Harvard professor, testified and spoke truth to power yesterday at the commission, told the unpack the history of how the court is an anti-democratic institution and will never fulfill our ambitions yes, to become a true multiracial democracy unless we reform the court. Yes, indeed. It is way past time to expand the court. Uh, Megan hatcher Mays and Brian Fallon, thank you so much for your time, your insights tonight. Always appreciate it. Still ahead, the landmark agreement on a huge tax overhaul for big companies doing business around the world. Back in 60 seconds with a White House official.
will not impose any tax increase on people making less than $400,000. But it's time for corporate America and the wealthiest 1% of Americans to just begin to pay their fair share. Just their fair share. Pay their fair share. That was President Biden back in April in his joint address to Congress, laying out the details of how to pay for his jobs and family plan. His central talking point, that many of the nation's biggest companies avoid paying their fair share of taxes, especially via tax havens overseas. You know, the Apples, the Amazons, the Facebooks and the like. It's time to pay up. And now, it seems, we're close to a new global deal. 130 countries from around the world have joined hands with the Biden administration to back a global minimum tax rate. What does that mean and why should you care? Well, a global minimum tax rate would discourage big corporations from moving their headquarters to low tax jurisdictions abroad and hiding profits generated in the US or any other country. President Biden released a statement saying today marks an important step in moving the global economy forward to be more equitable for workers and middle class families in the United States and around the world. He goes on to say, multinational corporations will no longer be able to pit countries against one another in a bid to push down tax rates and protect their profits at the expense of public revenue. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen calls it a historic day for economic diplomacy. And you know, it kind of is. She says, for decades, the United States has participated in a self-defeating international tax competition, lowering our corporate tax rates only to watch other nations lower theirs in response. The result was a global race to the bottom. Who could lower their corporate rate further and faster? No nation has won this race. So what are the details of the agreement? How's it all going to work? And what happens next? Here to discuss from the White House is Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics, and he's also Deputy Director of the National Economic Council, Dalip Singh. Uh, Dalip, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. All these countries have agreed to a global minimum tax rate of 15%. Is that now a done deal? And are there other items still on the negotiating table? So, Mehdi, good to be with you. And uh, first of all, it's at least 15%. But let me, let me step back. Uh, as you said, this is an agreement by 130 countries, covers more than 90% of the global economy. It has two parts. One is, as you say, it's an agreement to a minimum corporate tax rate of at least 15%. For context right now, there is no minimum corporate tax rate. It's effectively zero. And there's a second part which allows for a limited reallocation of taxing rights on the largest and most profitable multinationals from where they're headquartered to where they actually earn profits. But let me, let me explain why this matters. I mean, when, when you hear President Biden talk about a foreign policy for the middle class, this is exactly what it means in practice. You know, the global economy has changed dramatically. Capital is now incredibly mobile. Companies can shift their corporate headquarters to the cheapest location by pressing a few buttons. And that has led to this destructive race to the bottom that Secretary Yellen and President Biden talked about. Uh, you've seen countries compete by lowering their tax rates as far as possible, as fast as possible, so, to lure multinationals, their jobs, their profits, and that's done a lot of harm to our workers. But, Delhi, one of those countries, Ireland, is famous as an international haven for big corporations which are looking to pay lower taxes. Ireland has yet to sign on to the agreement, correct me if I'm wrong. What is the administration's plan if some low tax countries don't agree to this minimum rate? It can't work if everyone's not on board, can it? It can work. Uh, look, we have more than 90% of the global economy that signed up for this. There are some holdouts. We have time to bring them on board. But it's important to understand there will also be strong incentives in the administration's tax proposals uh, that would deny tax deductions for multinationals that locate in tax havens. And so effectively, Mehdi, when you have more than 90% of the global economy that signs up to an agreement like this, when do you ever get 130 countries agreeing to anything, by the way? then the incentives for the rest to follow are incredibly strong. So we feel confident. Congressional Republicans have raised concerns about the agreement, of course, as they shock horror. Representative Kevin Brady of Texas said in a statement today, the Biden administration has agreed to a global minimum tax structure that favors foreign headquartered companies and workers over American ones. How do you respond to that? Look, uh, I, I fundamentally disagree. This is about creating a level playing field right now. Uh, countries, uh, companies are competing based on whether they can locate in a tax haven. After this agreement, companies are going to compete based on their ability to innovate, based on the skills and the ingenuity of their workers, uh, based on the quality of our institutions and the quality of our business environment. I like our chances. Let's have self-confidence in who we are and what we can do in a fair competition. 
What about Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan Chase? Not someone I'm a fan of, but I know he was close to the Obama Biden administration and to the Democrats. He says this idea of a global minimum tax is great in theory, but won't work in practice. It's a pipe dream. Is he wrong? Yeah, here again, I just disagree. I mean, let's, let's go back to, to why this matters. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in this global race to the bottom. It's done tremendous harm. Let me explain why. Right now, corporate tax revenues as a percent of US GDP, it's about 1%. As a percentage of federal tax revenues, corporate, corporate corporations generate less than 10%. And what that's done is it's shifted more than 80% of the federal tax burden onto workers. And that affects everyone. It's, uh, it's, it's sapped the resources, the public resources that could have been invested in the pandemic recovery, in healthcare, in childcare, in broadband, clean drinking water, affordable housing, infrastructure, R&D. So this is an agreement to end that competition. As I say, this was 130 countries coming together. President Biden deserves a tremendous amount of credit for his leadership and mobilizing the world, including countries that don't see eye to eye with us and, and finding agreement on a debate okay. that's been going on for almost no. a decade. It's a big win. Don't uh, uh, Dalib, I'm glad that 130 countries have signed up for this. It's a good idea. Now I hope you'll go back into that building behind you and persuade President Biden to sign up to a wealth tax as well. But before I let you go, one last quick question. Good news today. The Congressional Budget Office says the US economy is booming, but they're also warning about a sharp increase in inflation. How worried are you about inflation? Is that a legitimate fear for Americans to have? Look, uh, right now, what we're seeing is a global economy that was almost entirely shut down uh, to one that's reopening and, and very robustly. Are there gonna be some dislocations in global supply chains? Yes, but the real story here is the American economy is coming back strongly. We're projected to grow almost 7% this year. It's the fastest in almost 40 years. The unemployment rate is gonna drop from a peak of over 14% uh, to likely under 4% by 2023. That's seven years faster than after the 2009 crisis. Uh, the economy is a very good story. Dalip Singh, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. When we return, as, as the Chinese Communist Party celebrates its 100th birthday, what is on the horizon as the East and the West get increasingly confrontational? And what about the Chinese people? Back after this. Scenes from the Chinese Communist Party's 100th anniversary celebration today. Dramatic events like these have become common in the world's new superpower in recent years. Thousands gathered in Tiananmen Square waving flags and singing slogans, celebrating the CCP. Slogans like, listen to the party, be grateful to the party. Not sure that's my kind of party, but there you go. It was President Xi Jinping's words that were most emblematic of how China sees itself now as a global power. Quote, the Chinese people will never allow foreign forces to bully, oppress, 
or enslave us, she said. It's not exactly the same tone as the working class uh, revolutionary party that, you know, founded with, I think it was 50 members back in 1921, a big shift since then. The CCP back then was formed to fight China's increasingly unpopular and corrupt ruling party, the Kuomintang. And it was Mao Zedong, the commander in chief of the CCP's Red Army, who led the party to victory, forming the People's Republic of China in 1949. But the China of 2021 under Xi Jinping is no longer the starving, war-torn nation it was over 100 years ago. It's reached a level of global dominance today that's put smaller nations and the world's superpowers, Western powers, on high alert. Under President Xi, China has expanded its military to unprecedented levels, growing its nuclear arsenal and ballistic capabilities. And economists project China's economy will overtake the US's as early as 2028. NATO and G7 leaders, including President Biden, are all worried. Biden's administration has called China the US's greatest security threat. And they're not just concerned about China's growth posing an economic challenge, its dominance as an authoritarian world power with brutally repressive policies risks influencing other parts of the world. Just look at what's going on in Xinjiang, in that western province of China, a region twice the size of Turkey, where China's Uyghur population and other Muslim-majority ethnic groups have faced what many call ethnic cleansing by the Chinese government. Estimates say it's been keeping more than one million Uyghurs against their will in camps over the past few years, in a large network of what the state calls re-education camps to indoctrinate them out of their distinct culture and religion. They say to fight terrorism. But it's perhaps China's less talked about Orwellian surveillance apparatus that's allowed the Uyghur subjugation to be as oppressive as it's been. From using AI to track people's emotions on the streets to installing QR codes on their houses to track who goes in and out. A New York Times investigation into the state's surveillance there called it a virtual cage. So with few reporters allowed in, what do we definitively know about what it's like on the ground and who helped build what's become a seemingly ironclad police state. Joining me now to discuss this is journalist Jeffrey Kane. He's the author of a new book, The Perfect Police State, an undercover odyssey into China's terrifying surveillance dystopia of the future. There's a mouthful and there's an important book. Jeffrey, you spent time on the ground in Xinjiang. Can you tell us about that? What was it like? How hard was it to get in? Were you able to speak to people there? It was um, the 21st century uh, George Orwell surveillance dystopia. I had most recently spent time there in December 2017, uh, back when with back when with this dystopia was starting to pick up, and it was virtually impossible, uh, aside from just a few exceptions, to actually speak to anyone. People were terrified. They were scared. And you know, in my career, I, I have a journalistic career covering authoritarian regimes. I've been to North Korea, to Myanmar, Turkey, Russia. And what I saw there just blew away what was going on in so many places. The amount of technological repression, the use of AI, the use of facial recognition, it truly is a place where everyone is monitored 24-7 and they have absolutely no freedom. Jeffrey, a lot of people talk about the abuses in the re-education camps, and rightfully so. We've covered it on this show. But you take a closer look at the police state, the surveillance state, the frameworks that those camps are operating within. You talk about the use of artificial intelligence, as you mentioned, facial recognition, DNA collection across Xinjiang province. What was the most frightening, the most draconian of things that you found out about that's going on there? Well, I spent a number of years, three years among Uyghur refugees in Turkey. This is where most of the refugees have escaped to. And what was most terrifying hearing their stories, these were both people who had escaped, but also people who had helped build the surveillance system and had been on the inside. And they had talked about the way that artificial intelligence was being deployed. So um, if you've seen the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise, uh, the, the government there literally set up uh, an AI system that gathered mass data from cameras, from you know grocery store purchases to try to, um, in bizarre ways, just to try to predict whether people would commit a terrorist act or a crime in the future. And so uh, th this AI system, which is called the, IGO the IJOP, the Integrated Joint Operations Platform, would send nudges and bumps and notifications to police officers to tell them that someone was acting suspicious, that um, you know they had gone in to their home through the back door instead of the front door that day, or they were late to work by two hours, or uh, they had to visit the doctor because they might have been sick. Just anything, 
for some reason, just anything that can be deemed uh, unusual or irrational is considered a uh, terrorist by this system. And so these police officers will swoop in and take them away to a concentration camp to indoctrinate, to brainwash them, um, because they've essentially been told that they will commit a, a pre-crime, just like in uh, some kind of sci-fi movie. And th this was the most terrifying thing, because everybody was scared. I mean, everybody, they, they had family back in Xinjiang. They weren't sure whether they were going to wake up one day and they, they were going to be disappeared to a camp because they, uh, you know, they bought, uh, you know, they bought a beer at the local Crazy. store, and that means that they must be bad. And yet, despite all of what's going on there, you also write in your book, The Police State, about how American companies have benefited from the plight of these um, minority uh, groups in Xinjiang, Muslim groups in Xinjiang. You list Amazon, Adidas, Calvin Klein, even Apple. Uh, you write, was another American company that benefited. It had connections to at least three factories in its supply chain that employed Uyghur laborers forcibly transferred from the camps. Apple, you write, said they found no evidence of any forced labor. Is that part of the problem, that no matter how much we denounce what's happening there, some of our biggest companies are, are wittingly or unwittingly exploiting the people there, and we're all buying the products? That is the biggest problem, and one of the biggest uh, questions about this region is that our supply chains have become so globalized that to get a lot of the garments that we use or, or cotton, this region produces a great deal of cotton, um, electronics, there's there's assembly factories there. Um, you know, major global multinational corporations have found themselves caught in a very difficult situation because uh, many of them indirectly through these supply chains have been tapping into uh, forced labor, often without knowing it, sometimes um, with simply being uh, complacent or, or trying to cover their eyes. I mean, there are, there are many different instances of this happening. And Apple was one example of a company that reportedly, according to press reports, um, did drop a, a supplier in China because there were concerns over uh, the components being made with forced labor from these Uyghur camps. Well, small victories, I guess. Um... It seems to be a difficult issue to address because of all the geopolitics. On the one hand, you have those on the extreme left who say, all these reports are just Western propaganda. It's a CIA conspiracy trying to escalate a conflict with Beijing. And then you have those on the right, extreme right in particular, like Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, who exploit this situation, pretending to care about Uyghurs in order to simply justify their hawkishness on China. It feels like the Uyghurs are stuck in the middle, pawns in some kind of political game between kind of Western ideological factions. Oh yes, I agree completely. I think that you just hit the nail right on the head. Right on the head. Uh, these uh, Uyghurs, they are trapped between uh, th these these ideological battles going on around the world. This this talk of a second Cold War that that the U.S. and China are going to be colliding in the world of trade and technology and maybe military competition. The Uyghurs are essentially left out of much of this discussion um, because you know on the on the far left, people say that you know we we uh, we're concerned. About, you know, China. This is all made up. This is a CIA plot. This is. Um, you know, Donald Trump simply making things up, Biden simply making things up to try to smear China. And then on the far right, uh, you know, people just say these things that, you know, that we need to, uh, you know, we need to toughen up against China. We need to use this as as a reason to engage in a second Cold War, which is not necessarily what I think is needed um, right now. And, and that so, is what's terrifying. Is that, Yes. So question to you, as China continues to expand its reach, whether physically or economically or diplomatically, especially under President Xi Jinping, do you worry that its model of governance, this authoritarian, almost Orwellian police state that's become also an economic powerhouse, that that risks enabling, encouraging aspiring autocrats worldwide? It does. I think that the Xinjiang model is exactly what many uh, autocrats and authoritarian leaders um, aspire to. I mean, this is, it's certainly the most extreme example, I think, in the present world that we have at, of a, a dictatorial system built on technology. But these technologies, the, the AI, the facial recognition, this police surveillance, it's reaching new uh, new pacings. It's, it's reaching new advances that we just haven't seen before. And so um, this is what makes these tools so powerful. Chinese companies have already been 
uh, exporting some of these technologies to you know quasi authoritarian regimes to hardline regimes in parts of um, South America, Central Asia, um, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. It truly is um, you know something that I, I mean I do think that we need to worry um, about the future of how these regimes are going to operate because this is not this is no longer the world of the Soviet Union. This yes. is no longer the world of North Korea. This is new stuff. One last question to you. How bad is it going to get? Because you outlined some pretty scary stuff in your book, but this is technology. Technology gets improved, even awful technology. How bad could it get for Uyghurs in Xinjiang when it comes to the surveillance state? Well, I think that there is still a lot more that has not come out. I think that we've only scratched the surface. And my book is really, it's not meant to be the exhaustive final word on what's happening to the Uyghurs. Um, I think that China is a black box in so many ways. And I think that by now, I mean, my book, the information comes from 2019 at the most recent. Uh, by now in 2021, I think that there are things going on there that are beyond anything that we can imagine. And that I, I think these are going to come out eventually. That is truly uh, depressing and scary, but we thank you for writing the book and drawing attention to this issue. Uh, Jeffrey Kane, author of The Perfect Police State, thank you for your time tonight. And a bit of breaking news this evening. Attorney General Merrick Garland has ordered a temporary freeze on scheduling any federal executions, according to an official who spoke with NBC News. This policy decision comes in stark contrast to Donald Trump, whose DOJ, remember, restarted federal executions after a 17-year pause and ultimately put 13, 13 inmates to death. No president in more than 120 years had overseen as many federal executions. Last month, I spoke with Sister Helen Prujan, a leading advocate for the abolition of the death penalty, and she said she anticipated, at the time she told me she anticipated President Biden would be moving in this direction. He does have a lot on his plate. I have no doubt that he's going to end federal executions with the jurisdiction in which he is. And we'll have to wait and see whether the Biden DOJ continues to pursue death penalty charges, charges, not just executions, as well. But that does it for the Mandy Hassan Show this week. Catch The Week with Joshua Johnson tomorrow night in this time slot, 7 p.m., right here on Peacock. You can join us anytime on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram or TikTok. We're all over that social media. We're also on TV, as you know. But for now, thanks for watching. Good night.